Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arthur, I'm from UOB. Um, and we have been doing this report for seven years now, seven years. So we started this in 2017. Uh, and I'm very glad that you're all here to join us today. We're gonna have an exciting uh, panel later on, you know, with uh, Wan Yi, uh, Benjamin from uh, Stacks, as well as Kelvin from Funding Societies. But before that, you know, I'm just going to take a few moments to share with you some of the findings from our FinTech in ASEAN report 2023. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background, why seven years? 2017, we looked at FinTech funding and we realized that, hey, it's just global data, US data, European data, and Asia Pacific. What about ASEAN? This is our backyard and we want to know what is exactly happening in this part of the world. So we decided to look at the ASEAN 6, right? So Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and uh, Philippines. And we want us to really deep dive into, you know, what are the funding trends, what's happening in this area, uh, in this part of the world, okay? So, all right. If you look at this slide, it starts from 2019. 2019, 1.3 billion in ASEAN FinTech. And just to explain the different colors, the blue signifies the early stage funding, so series A and B. And the red signifies the late stage uh, series C and above, okay? And if you look at the 2019, in fact, when we started in 2017, it was just about 400 million in terms of funding in ASEAN. And in 2019, it jumped to 1.3 billion, right? And this was really off the back of uh, the, the rise in fintech, you know, the investment into wallets and payments. And we, decided, we saw that this actually went around the region, uh, especially from in Singapore as well as in Indonesia. All right. Uh, 2020, we saw that that's a COVID year. And so there was a slight dip in funding. Um, but you see a huge spike in 2021 and 2022. And this is really off the back of rapid digitalization you know, everyone was staying home, everyone was using digital services. A lot of merchants were actually getting onto e-commerce platforms. And that's where you see a lot of funding going into um, the fintechs in 2021. So 2022, uh, you see as well that the number of deals, you know, right at the top 235, uh, was where you saw a lot of uh, dry powder coming to this region, right? And um, post-pandemic, you see that in year to date, 2023, and we actually cut off the data in September, first nine months of 2023. Uh, we are at 1.3 billion. Uh, but I'll, I'll explain later on, you know, where the bright sparks are. You know, it's not all doom and gloom, and it's not all about funding winter, okay? You also realize that uh, in 2023, you know, most of the investments went into the early stage. So the, the blue... Uh, bars there, you know, compared to 2022, where it's mostly in the late stage, where there was a lot of um, risk aversion, so the money went to more of the larger uh, startups, right? So if we move on, the bulk of the funding was actually raised in, in Singapore and Indonesia, right? So Singapore, 59% of the entire share of ASEAN, no surprises, you know, um, Singapore FinTech Festival is probably one of the reasons, you know, why we are bringing everyone into Singapore. But this was always, not always 59%, right? Last year, it was 53%. And in the earlier years, it was in the 40s. And on the right, you see the number of deals at 94. Uh, you will recall in the previous slide, it was 230, uh, 235 in the previous year, right? So the number of deals have come down quite significantly. Um, you will also notice that uh, one key difference would be maybe uh, the Philippines as well. It was 7% last year, but uh, this year it's about 2%. And that was off the back of the fund raised by Tonic Bank last year. So let's move on. There are signs of recovery, right? If you look at this declining graph here, the second bar is the peak at second quarter 2022. That was when, or rather, that was before the Fed started to raise rates, right? And ever since then, you see a declining trend, um, you know, 892 million, 
you know, all the way down to 230 million last quarter. But look at the last column. The last column is not even a quarter. It's 1st October to mid-November. And already we've seen almost $500 million of investment. Most of it going to late-stage companies in Singapore. Um, but you see there's a bright spark there, right? Earlier on, it was all going to the early-stage companies, but now it's going to the uh, later-stage companies as well. Yeah, so you see that the, there are four major uh, companies that contributed to that. Uh, so that's Investry, Sing Life, Utrip, as well as Trax. So another bright spark that we've noticed is green tech and green fintech, right? Um, you see that since 2019, the funding going into green and green fintech has almost doubled every year. 31 million, 65 million, 129 million, and 300 million last year. So even though it has dropped to 170 million uh, this year, uh, we see that there is significantly more interest uh, even from customers, even from SMEs and corporates that want to actually uh, adopt green practices, right? And we see that this is a, clearly an area, uh, it's a bright spark in the region. So before I introduce the next panel, uh, which is coming up to talk about sustainability and business, UOB did a business outlook survey uh, early this year. We surveyed more than 2,000 SMEs across the region and we polled them on their sustainability uh, practices as well as their inclinations, right? And we found that more than 40% of them have started to adopt sustainable practices, right? So this could be in the form of, you know, starting to change out their fleet uh, from ICE vehicles to EVs. It could be in the form of adopting more sustainable paper-based packaging, right? And why are they doing this? The top three reasons. Number one, a better reputation. And they're doing it for the brand. Because it is important uh, to be seen as sustainable. It is important uh, to be seen as caring for the environment. It also helps to attract investors. And finally, there are many MNCs out there, uh, their customers that do ask them about their ESG practices. And it increasingly has become the norm and the standard uh, for MNCs to want to work with suppliers, either upstream or downstream, that have sustainable practices. So beyond this, the icing on the cake would be that when you are sustainable, uh, when you are able to show you know, uh, you know, how sustainable you are, you know, it does actually help you in terms of financing as well. So from the banking perspective, there is sustainable financing. Uh, in the past, we only look at your credit worthiness. Now, credit worthiness is simply a measure of how trustworthy you are as an organization. But having an ESG profile, you know, having a, a carbon uh, dashboard is really about you showing how much you care about the world and how much you care about being a sustainable business. So, we especially prepared a video for you, you know, before, before we invite Wan Yi, Benjamin and Kelvin up. So, please enjoy. Thank you. regions on Earth. Southeast Asia is also one of the most vulnerable regions to the effects of climate change. Extreme temperatures, unpredictable weather patterns and rising sea levels are drastically reshaping the region. With coastal cities in Southeast Asia sinking faster than anywhere else in the world, many communities face the threat of displacement. Sustainability is no longer a choice. It is the only way forward. From small-scale producers to distributors, retailers and large corporations. Many are starting the transition to a greener economy.
harnessing technology, green techs and green fintechs are building innovative solutions to help businesses kickstart their green journey. For example, Indonesia's Daya Solaras Group uses data platform ESGpedia from Stax to enable carbon reporting that complies with GRI standards. Emissions data across its value chain are automatically calculated, enabling the company to measure its progress against benchmarks. As we reach a pivotal moment for our planet, will ASEAN's changemakers rise to the occasion It's a great video there, um, particularly from Stax. Um, I'd like to welcome up Wan Yi Wong, who's the uh, head of fintech for the very awesome PwC. Wan Yi. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Uh, maybe I'll just welcome my esteemed panelists. So we have Kelvin here, co-founder and group CEO of Funding Societies and Modalku. And of course, Ben, founder and managing director of Stax. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you here. Thanks for being here to listen to our report. Uh, this is the 8th Singapore FinTech Festival, 8th um, edition by the UOB for PwC. is our fifth year with UOB talking about FinTechs in ASEAN. So... Um, Maybe I, I'll just take a bit of air time to thank people first. So, so thank you very much, UOB. I have Janet sitting there. <laughs> Janet and of course, Arthur, you have heard of. Um, and Ruben, uh, SFA, who is in the bright red. And of course, uh, from my team, Huan Chen. Uh, thank you very much for putting this together. And I hope that you have enjoyed the insights. But today, uh, my two good friends here to share with you um, thoughts outside in, inside out, bottom up any way you want, but we, we have potentially an open mic. If you really have a burning question, feel free to raise your hand. We, have not, we don't have a lot of time, but we'll try to see how it goes. But let me just kickstart for you first. Let's start high and, and, and broad. What really is green fintech? Like, what do green fintech do? Um, can, can both of you enlighten us? Maybe sure. Ben first. Yep. So if you break down the words, right, green fintech, right, GFT, green fintech. So firstly, you know, there's technology involved. Okay, technology that helps to make the, you know, the world more green. But we are in the fintech festival after all. So there still needs to be this intersection between the financial services and technology. And so if you break it down, green fintech, I feel that it is actually uh, very interesting because the financial sector bank roles, every single sector out there. I'm sure Kelvin has clients from many different industries, so does UOB. Okay, so this could be construction industry, agriculture industry, manufacturing industry, logistics industry, energy industry, and we go on and on. So I think uh, the role of finance is really important here, and therefore technology helps to bridge uh, the financial sector with the different real-world economies to really lubricate you know, the green transition. I think... Green fintech is really end-to-end -end financial services that's enabled by technology with a consideration for greenness, right? I think oftentimes people think about green financing, but that's only the, uh, the tip of the iceberg, right? There's infrastructure that's reporting so and so forth. So I, we see it as an end-to-end -end, uh, financial services that is enabled by technology with a consciousness of uh, green and sustainability. Thank you. And, and with this fintech and adding a green that's a lot more out there, and of course in this green or rather fin, fintech ecosystem, what I love the most is friendship, right? Um, everyone is partnering with each other to solve problems. And of course the two of you just announced a partnership. Um, I would like to hear a bit more, but of course how I see the two of you coming together, it's really to tackle and help MSMEs in the green agenda. So, so can, you, can you tell us more about what's there for MSMEs in this green agenda and maybe a bit more about your partnership? Sure, 
I'll go first. So, you know, we talk about ASEAN right now, right? So, in the ASEAN markets, you know, the economy is made up 90% of the SMEs, made up 90% by the SMEs. So, we can't go green without the SMEs, right? So, it's important that we want to be able to have or deliver solutions for the SMEs. So, I think, you know, our company has always been a technology provider. Whereas, you know, while we are dealing with the MSMEs, inevitably, we always hear this one line, which is why. Right? And then that I get reminded by another line, which is from a famous movie called Show Me the Money. Right? So therefore, it would be really incentivizing the SMEs if we were able to pair them up, besides using technology, but also with a financial services provider who has the same principles as we do, which is to enable MSMEs. And that's why we found a great partner in funding societies. I think the partnership is actually really, really interesting, right? That we find that Oftentimes, when you speak to SMEs, a lot of times they're just focusing on the day-to-day -day growth and survivability, right? So asking them to do additional work is actually extremely painful. Candidly, sometimes you're taking time from, from building the business or actually keeping it afloat, right? And candidly, when it comes to the broader ecosystem, the fact that you're green doesn't give you a lot of incentive at the moment. So you're going to spend more time by not getting much in return. Why do you even bother doing it? So what we find the partnership with Stack is interesting is that it allows us to actually have a standardized form of uh, ESG uh, data points and collections. And then with standard information like electricity, consu fuel consumption, so on and so forth, it allows you to convert into a common language that uh, impact investors understand or focus on, notably greenhouse gas emission. So that common language is very important because every time you notice that a lot of impact funds, they don't have a very clear view of, okay, what is impact? How do you define impact? How do you measure impact? So this is a very good stepping stone towards having a common definition and calculations that this is the amount of impact that this company is doing. And this is, uh, as a result of that, this is the amount of value of uh, financing discount that I should be giving to you. So as part of funding society, what we have done is so that when it comes to ESG, of course, there's social and government, right? But if we focus on the environment angle only, what we have done is that we've implemented our own ESMS system, environment and social management system, right? Whereby we've incorporated, introduced a whole environment risk management framework such that by each of the industry, we know what are the key risks that is applicable to each of these SMEs within that sector and we've incorporated it as part of our underwriting. Because if they can manage this well, the risk of our loans also becomes lower and consequently, we can charge them at a better price. And the goal is that over time, this data point can allow us to substantiate uh, lower cost of fund from impact as well as sustainability institutions so that we can pass it on to the SMEs as well. So, sounds like a lot of work, but a lot of benefits. Um, I, I just want to un understand, you see common language, and of course, um, funding societies or Modalco, it's, it's in the region, not just Singapore. What, what is the challenge in, in the cross-border? Like, how do you actually address the needs of your customers in the various countries? Um, and, and how is that platform actually delivering what different region is looking out for? So I think the key challenge within, by operating in different countries is that the overall environment uh, as well as uh, economic context is very, very different, or even the level of digitalization is very different. For example, whenever we have any green initiatives, the first country we talk about is Indonesia, because of palm oil, deforestation, so and so forth. Whereas talk about Malaysia is going to be, hey, food security and whatnot, right? So how can we actually convert and each of the value chains have different concerns. But what, it, what by working with Stack and Kennedy, other ESG partners, is that it allows us to convert into a single denominator, which is carbon emission. That, hey, based on uh, I'm funding this particular farmer, how do I verify that this farmer is not... Uh, not farming at a deforested area that you should not be farming, right? And as a result of that, what's the implication of it, right? So by, by standardizing the different nuances into a single common denominator allows us to actually manage and measure our progress a lot more effectively. Yeah, absolutely agree. So that's where the role of technology comes in because otherwise, I wouldn't know how we are able to tackle this problem of such a magnitude. So, you know, with the end-to-end -end digitalization uh, that technology can provide, we are now able to convert really operational data <clears throat> all the way from the source. You know, think simple things like fuel consumption, electricity consumption, you know, a number of hours work, the breakdown of the employees on a certain farm and multiply it by multiple plantations. That is actually some operational data that most companies have anyway could be now converted on an automated fashion in a digital sense to a proper ESG format. And that actually is important for business because these companies now understand, right? Even before the regulations have 
been implemented, buyers are now asking them for this information. You know, if they are willing to be providing this little bit of extra work to partner with a digital platform, they will be able to get enabled. You know, by the way, we are doing this for MSMEs for free. So if they are able to do this for free, okay, to get enablement, to get a better profile and therefore sell better, and of course, during the process, get a better service and better product from the funding societies, that is really a wonderful outcome for many of these companies. So, so you mentioned buyers and you mentioned borrowing costs, right, underwriting. Just, just maybe give us a sense how, how mature is that right now? Like, do, do, as I'm, I'm just asking if there's any MSME owner out there. Is, is there very tangible benefit that I can get right now? Or you think it takes a bit of time for you to be able to collect sufficient data to verify that? Yeah, so, so any of the roadblocks or any benefits that I should reap from this? So I think candidly, when it comes to cost of fund uh, perspective, the fact that you have ESG opens the door for you to speak to certain lenders, but the reality is that it has not, or very rarely has it translated to actual tangible cost savings. Out of our few dozen of lenders, there's only one lender who gave us a 25 to 50 basis point cut in our cost of fund because of our ESG reporting and initiatives. The, other, the, other, the rest of them have not reached that stage yet. So the goal is that by having this in a more meaningful way, the reality, if you think from a financial institution's perspective, they have to build a business case for their own bosses and credit committees and so on and so forth. This helps them to cross the bridge. And the hope is that the, the crossing of the bridge will be much faster, not just one out of the few dozens of lenders that we have. And I agree that it's actually right now at the tipping point, you know, because the EU regulations have been announced and implemented from 1st January 2024. And guess what, you know, EU buys a lot of products from the Southeast Asian region. So it actually has a spillover effect. So we have SMEs, trade associations, companies coming to us actually, asking about how they can get better prepared because they are trying to sell to external markets. So while the regulations in Singapore actually are coming to, you know, from 2025 onwards, there is actually this uh, desire or actually this incentive for companies now to become more ready because if they're able to get ready today, they will still become more competitive competitive, you know, tomorrow. Thank you. I, I, I still have a few more questions, but I'm just thinking whether I should open it up. Any, anybody with burning questions? Okay, too shy. Okay, I'll help, I'll help you ask. I, I, I just want to see, because we are at tipping point right now, right, as you mentioned. Um, what, what is one thing that you want to rally from all of us here? I, I'm sure we are coming from ver various backgrounds. It could be the incumbents like the financial institution, a fintech, MSMEs, regulators, consultants like yourself. What, what is that, that thing that you think the ecosystem should come together to make this work? Because I, I think this is the only way we can go forward. But how can we make it easier and faster and perhaps cheaper for everyone? I think it's a sense of awareness that, you know, a lot of these opportunities, opportunities are adjacent, right? So, uh, so, I have other partnerships, for example, fleet management provider companies, building systems companies. So, these are actually adjacent opportunities whereby they are taking care of traditional operational data for the last decade. And, you know, they have been operating fleets or managing fleets or managing or buildings energy efficiency for a long time. Why can't we take this data? integrate this together with a ESG technology, okay, and therefore be able to bring the operational data to life into an ESG report. So that's green tech. And how do we extend that to FIN? Of course, there are a lot of adjacent possibilities in the financial sector too, to truly allow this to be a true, groove, true blue green FinTech. And for this, maybe I hand over to Kelvin. I think probably two key areas, right? One is that when it comes to the, the real world economy per se, right, the reality is that unless the big player starts moving, it's very hard for the small players to follow. Oftentimes, we find a bit of a cute situation whereby whenever there's grants, it goes to the big players because there's bigger impact. Whenever it comes to changes that is painful, we always say, oh, startups and small companies to move first, right? Which is a bit of an odd situation there when they have very little resources to do it, right? But my sensing is that with and the fact that you see there's a whole green forum per se, the fact that the, uh, the government is pushing for, from it, I do think that with the bigger corporates, especially for government-linked companies, can start driving and leading initiatives, it would have a multiplication effect across the entire, a multiplier effect across the entire market, right? Similarly, when it comes to institutions, uh, we do hope that at these existing incumbents, like, uh, like 
like, like UOB and other banks can take the lead in terms of availing such financing to, the, to, to SMEs as well because then, you have, then it starts building a momentum of that. But I also realise that when it comes to SMEs, our guidance is always that the fact that it's early and if you do it, it allows you to be ahead of the curve. It allows you to be ahead of the curve, right? Rather than, and if this becomes a, a necessary requirement for foreign buyers, you will be ahead of the curve to take advantage of it. But of course, the question is how soon will that transition into it, right? Our guidance, or at least what within funding societies we have done, is that we have allocated dedicated resources for it in a way that is targeted, that is helpful for us. Not just doing it for reporting for reporting sake, but actually things that will be meaningful for us. And what it has done is that, be in terms of building uh, knowledge within the organisation, be in terms of getting ready for standards, be in terms of implementing frameworks within uh, and credit underwriting parameters across the region. We are always ready such that when the tangible benefits start kicking in in a big way, we will not be a late comer to that and can take a full advantage of it. And this kind of transition can actually keep, help an organisation to be meaningfully faster or step faster. So that's why we do think that while it's still early, get ready in a tangible, targeted way. Uh, because when it comes, I think that the, the benefits will outweigh the cost that you're investing now. Thank you. Um, I, we don't have a lot of time left, so, so just one wrap-up uh, question from me. Um, just, just, just bringing up the crystal ball, I, I, I think green was a buzzword, I think started more, I mean it's been around, but like last year really came through big and loud. Um, where, where do you think this journey on sustainability and green, uh, it's heading towards. Um, just, just give us your prediction for the next one to three years. So, actually, I think we are already at that point, you know, where everybody understands this topic. You know, everybody, you know, on, on a single newspaper every single day, right, you are always able to find some news about a certain new initiative driving green transformation. So, uh, depending on what source you look at, you know, there's a Bloomberg source that says that by 2025, there will be 50 trillion US dollars of funds under a ESG mandate. Right? And that's about one third of the wealth management space. So that means that you know, in, in due course to come, ESG investing or green investing will become the norm. You know, it's not going to be an outlier, it's not going to be a minority, it's actually going to be at least half of all funds invested. So in that case, okay, to echo what Kelvin said, be, be in front of the curve simply means that you are more investable, simply means that you can fetch a premium, simply means that more investors will want to invest money in you. So it is already here, you know, in the next three years, it will become a norm that many investors, financiers are actually going to be placing a premium on greener companies. Actually, I do think, uh, agree in terms of the tipping point of it because of a few factors, right? Number one is that the, the push towards it, you start seeing that coming from a regulation from governments, especially in European countries, is becoming very, very tangible. It's partly driven by demographic change, right? That the Gen Zs cares about this meaningfully more and as more of them go into the voting population, guess what? They're going to vote. They're going to vote in, in favour of things like this, right? Um, so I think that that, that material change becomes uh, critical. But at the same time, the emerging markets are also becoming more and more ready to rise up to the occasion as well. Right? Previously, when a lot of the emerging markets are still focusing on just basic economy per se, hey, they may not have a lot of resources, but you see a lot of major economies have come up. Of course, the whole debate about who should be more responsible, is it the developing countries who have, developed countries who have been polluting for centuries or the ones, the new emerging, rising ups that should be responsible, that's a bigger debate uh, beyond us, right? But you start seeing that it is go going through the technology diffusion curve, right? but it's not just innovators who are just greenwashing, but moving into the early majority whereby, hey, there are meaningful work and hopefully soon meaningful money that's coming to and then subsequently to, to cascade down, right? And the subsequent uh, diffusion tends to happen quite quickly. So we do think that is a tipping point. We don't know when, but I think the guidance for us, we are always getting ready because once it happens, and if you're only doing that at that point in time, you'll be too late. Thank you. Don't be too late. So I think uh, the key message I get is um, always be ready. The tipping point is here. We don't know when it's going to really come with a, with a whoosh, but then I think we all should be ready. Um, with that, I think time is up, but thank you so much for digesting all your invaluable experience into bite-sized insights for us. I, I hope all of you learned something. We're going to just uh, be a bit selfish, take one minute to take a photo <laughs> with our partners. Uh, so, so with that, can I invite you to be an SFA? Thank you.